glad that uh, most of you have gotten your devotional books. I think maybe there's only one or two left. And we'd like to get those. One of them, Johanna, is uh, at the Evangelism Impact down in, uh, in uh, Myrtle Beach, which started Thursday night and concludes tomorrow. So I'm glad that she's there because I, I was reg- Brenda and I were registered, but we couldn't go because we had too many other things uh, crowding it out. But um, I'd like to ask two people to meet with me after the service in my office. One is Allison Taylor, and the other is Harper McDaniel. I have, I have something for you, Harper, that you had asked about some time ago, and I want to make sure I get it into your hands. And so I'll just put that away here, and then we'll go on from there. This is Love Month. If anybody has forgotten, shame, shame, shame. Valentine's Day is February the 14th. Now, maybe you don't believe in Valentine's Day, but I'll bet every one of you believes in love, especially marital love for those that are fortunate enough to still have their spouse with them. Do not overlook this date, gentlemen. Or at least celebrate the occasion for your darling wife's sake. Not too many of us are romantic, but I'm talking for myself as men. But when we remember it usually means something to our wives, then it becomes important. If you decide not to do it on the 14th, make sure... It is before and not after. She may think that you did forget and are trying to backtrack and cover your sin. I believe that all those unattached should get some love from the rest of us, too. So I'm going to ask whether all the members of this church would stand with me just now. Just the members of the church ask you all to to stand and remain standing for just a moment. I'll explain it. Now, that's that's not fair, is it? Because I get you to stand and I don't tell you why. (laughs) But I don't think that you'll mind. I really don't. Um, And now I'm going to ask if you would turn around you, and especially to the visitors, that you would say something that I think that you'll mean, and that is, God loves you, and so do I. Could you do that? And even turn to some of your fellow church members and spend a moment. God loves you, so do I. When you're finished, finished, you're welcome to take your seat once again. Thank you all for that, for reaffirming the fact that although you may or may not be interested in in a kind of a a Catholic saint that's given us this day of St. Valentine's Day, that you believe in the concept of love. And in February, at least we can celebrate it whether it's on that day or any other day. Because the church of Jesus Christ is a place for love. Don't you agree? Today we're going to explore five revelations about the true meaning of love. Firstly, let's take a moment to look at the Greek words that are used in the Bible for love. Because as with many languages and the limitations of English, the English language is a strange animal. It really is. 
I've often wondered what it must be like to have to try to learn this language. It's got all kinds of different languages in it. It's got German languages and French, French words, and it's got uh, Spanish words, and it's got all kinds of things in, in it. And there's all kinds of expressions that we use that never mean what we literally say. Now, after my, uh, my son uh, finished at uh, Southern Adventist University, he volunteered to become a missionary in Japan teaching English. And so he did that for about two and a half years. And while he was there, he learned Japanese. He had two teachers. He had a Japanese lady and he had an American that had been living and working in Japan for at least a decade that was in business. And uh, they both uh, taught him how to read and write and speak Japanese. One of the strangest things was trying to describe what we mean by the expressions that we use because if you take them literally, they don't seem to make any sense. You know what I'm talking about. When I took French when I was in high school, they had those also. And they were expressions that if you took them literally by the words that were in them, you wouldn't know what it was meaning. And yet we talk that way all the time. English is a very difficult language to learn because of that. Some of the Latin languages are much easier. I understand that Italian is probably the easiest language to learn. And of course, Spanish is related to it. And Portuguese is related to it. French is a whole other animal. There are Latin languages, but they're not like any of the others. And they take pride in their difficulty. You know, they have a I'm trying to remember what they call it. They have an academy, I guess, of French words. And so many words that are used in common uh, uh, usage in other languages where they take the American word and they use it as the American word, the French will not allow that. And so they have to come up with something uniquely French or that word is not allowed, especially if it's English. They're never going to let English. They've never forgiven, I, I think, the, the, uh, the English people that they overtook their empire. I think Napoleon probably ruined that, but nonetheless, it's true. The first revelation is about Greek words in the New Testament, and we need to consider them. Because as in many languages, there are many different nuances of words. Whereas we just have the word love and it means all kinds of different things. The first one we're going to look at is the word eros, which I think most of us can lock into. It's the excitement of physical passion. It's the magic of magnetic attraction. For me, it was one, not one enchanted evening, but it was one enchanted morning in Sabbath school in the central church in Orlando, Florida, when I looked across the room, and there she was. Long blonde hair, a black dress. You know, there's nothing like blonde hair in a black dress. It's stunning. It's stunning. But I wasn't interested in the dress so much. I was interested in who was in it. And I wanted to know who she was. And I don't know, should I tell Brenda? I'm always, I, I'm, uh, Brenda's gotten used to it and she forgives me for it. But I didn't have to try to find out who she was. She came up afterwards and introduced herself. And she made it easy. <laughs> you see, the, the Sabbath before, her mother had come up and greeted me. Uh, because I had just gotten there not too long just a, a couple of months after I arrived as an intern in the Orlando Central Church. And I don't know. Brenda's family is really special to me. Um, her mother is one of a, was one of a kind. And um, I'm glad. I could never tell mother-in-law jokes, never, because they all would have been lies, and I would have known it. 
Eros is the word that we get the word erotic from. So we don't think of that as a, as a uh, designation of love, but it, but it comes under that. And we understand it. It's the excitement that comes from contact with or attraction to that special person. Phileo. What does that sound like? Yeah, it could. There's a lot of different things it could sound like. It's that the name Philadelphia comes from it. The city of brotherly love. You know, I don't know. Um, that's, that's not appropriate anymore. I know it was the, uh, an important part for the development of our country. Uh, the uh, Declaration of Independence came from that place and also the Constitution of the United States. Very important things, but I don't, I don't think Philadelphia is a very hospitable place, actually. Uh, there's a lot of thugs running loose there. It's an embarrassment, I think, to the name of the city. But it's friendship love, like a best friend that you enjoy being with and enjoy their company. Another one is storge. It isn't used in the Bible, but it is one of the words for love. And it's phileo love. The love of a parent or caregiver who protects a helpless child or adult that they are responsible for. And then fourthly, the one that we hear about all the time in church is agape. Agape is God's selfless love for us. It's not based on any of the preceding, but unique, which gives and cares for those that are God's creation and seeks nothing from them except that they would accept his love and his blessings. God, God does not love us in order to control us. You can't control those that you love, can you? It has to be volitional. It's a gift that has to be presented. And when you pop the question, you're not always sure what the answer is going to be. But you know what you hope it's going to be. Circumstances driven by desire. Stimulated by physical involvement. Eros and depressed by hurt and alienation. You know, there are those that are attracted to the opposite sex, if you will, and when they are, when they are spurned, there's great anger. You know, there are, there are actually men that have killed women that turned them down. It looks like they were pretty wise to do so, but they didn't know that it was going to cost them their lives. The love that fills the empty place in a heart is neither eros nor philos. It's a love that gives, not a love that seeks to get. You understand? Sometimes people think there's a quid pro, pro here, that, that God gives us his love so that he can own us then and he can control us. That's not the truth of God's love. God loves us and sets us free. You can say no to God. You know, most people are saying no to God. And as Jesus said, that narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. And few there be that find it. But many, many of them go the easy way. And unfortunately, most people will be lost because they have no interest in the love of God. Agape is a principle. It is not necessarily devoid of emotion, but it is not dependent on emotion. It is love given with no strings attached, just because the other exists. 
That's the God that I know. That's the God that I love. I hope it's the same for you. Secondly, revelation. The second revelation is that there is a command to all who claim to believe in God to love. Not him, but love one another. Jesus said in John 15, in both verse 12 and 17, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Man, that's a tall order. I could love somebody uh, and maybe care for them, but how could I ever do so as God loves me? That's pretty hard. That's the limit. Now, we can like people. We can even put up with people. Lord, I put up with them. Of course, who puts up with us? Yeah, I'm looking at Brenda and she's smiling. I know. I know the answer to that. (laughs) Sometimes we put up with one another and we're very reluctant to express our true feelings about one another. Come on, guys. How much trouble is it for somebody that's had to put up with you and me to be able to remind them that they're wonderful and that we love them and we couldn't live without them? Brenda and I are getting to the point where people that we've known and loved are passing away. Some of them much younger than us. Did we tell them? Did we tell them when they were here? We are commanded by Jesus. If he is our Lord, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. You know what I'm talking about. If he's our Lord, he sets the highest standard for our behavior as those who claim to be one of his own. If we really love Jesus, we will love one another. Now, this church is a fortunate church for those of you that are a part of it. I keep hearing from people when we had our public meetings and people came and they they were charmed by the friendliness of the people in this church. And that's good reputation to have, folks. Some of those that that, uh, were the best at it have passed away and I miss them terribly. But then it seems as if the God who gives gifts motivates people to pick up the standard and carry it and continue that reputation for us as a people. Third, let's look at the third revelation. And let me ask you, let me make the statement by asking the question, how much need is there for love? I'm not necessarily talking about you and me. I'm talking about all of us as um, fellow sufferers in this world of sin and hate. You know, I don't know of a time in recent history when you've had so many small wars going on simultaneously. It seems like everybody hates each other. Everybody wants to kill each other. And we just keep getting sucked into one after another. It's a terrible thing that people can't get along. I think it's a a fair statement that they're so filled with rage because they don't have love in their life. They don't know where to find it. When your love cup is low, You may feel unloved, rejected, worthless, and empty. 
and you feel that you have nothing to give because you have nothing in your heart. Do you think that's true? Your world turns negative. And so you begin experiencing anger and criticism and sarcasm and guilt and bitterness. You have nothing but bitter gall to share with others. In 1965, there was a popular song that came out. The words were written by Hal David, and the music was written by Burt Backrack. Does anybody remember it? What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. What the world needs now is love, sweet love, not just for some, but for everyone. Now, I don't have the other verses because I didn't want to get carried away with it. But you know what it is? That thing is, is kind of a, almost an attack on God. Because in the other verses, it's talking about why do you have this? Why does this happen? Why do you allow that to happen? What this, this that you're talking about isn't something that's helpful to me. But nonetheless, it's an interesting theme, isn't it? Even the world can see the emptiness of goodness and the frequency of hostility. Children equate love with attention. Now, where's Sandy? I know she gave the children's story, and she moved because she used to be back there. Did she have to leave? She's in the children's room. Okay, she's doing – I see her back there. Okay. They're, they're all trying to do something for others. She can certainly attest to this. I've heard her talk about it at the church board before. <laughs> children equate love with attention, and when they're denied, they feel unloved. Children in the classroom will settle for bad attention rather than none. And so you can tell the, the situation in a young life when you have children that act up in class. The teacher will be unhappy with them. The teacher may scold them. The teacher may even punish them. But that's better than being ignored. Now, my wife works in the Adolescent Detention Center here in uh, New Hanover County. She often talks to me about these kids. You know, I don't know why more attention isn't given to that, because a lot of these kids are at the place where they can be salvaged. They're not hardened yet. They're still impressionable. Now, there was one there that was very strident. He said, I hate white people. And then he saw Brenda there and he said, except you. <laughs> Brenda's very good to them. She talks kindly to them. She doesn't use vulgarity to them. Can you imagine? People aren't even, people even in that kind of a position aren't careful about what they say and how they say it. Now, one of the kids use those words. They've been directed to them. So children in the classroom will often settle for bad attention rather than none, and they become obnoxious and disobedient and destructive. Do you think that we need love? It isn't just in the schools or in a detention center. It's in the world in general. People we rub shoulders with every day are walking around with empty hearts. They've been rejected had a relationship, the other partner decided to find another relationship. And so people bounce from one to the other, back and forth, and they still don't find what they're looking for. 
because they don't know how to define what they're looking for. The greatest tragedy for many is that they never experience the joy of giving. They never feel that they have anything to give. In Acts 20, verse 35, one of those passages that's not, they're the words of Jesus, but they're not found in the Gospels. Found in the book of Acts, Acts 20, verse 35. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to do what? Give than receive. What a tragedy. They don't even know that they don't know. They don't understand one of the basic truths of life, that the more you give, the more you receive. I've been blessed a lot more than I've blessed. Knowing Jesus Christ is the greatest blessing that anyone can have. Walking with him is the greatest fulfillment of life itself. It's the definition of life itself. We read in the uh, the book of Genesis about God walking in the coolness of the day in the garden to seek out his favorite people, (laughs) the only people at that point, Adam and Eve. Can you imagine how much that hurt God not to be able to do that anymore? Because they sided with the evil one. And they realized they'd been snookered when they did it. And they were embarrassed and they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. Fig leaves never work. (laughs) God has x-ray vision anyway. He's not ashamed of what he made, but oftentimes we are ashamed by what we've made of ourselves. And still, he loves us. What does John tell us in 1 John 4? God is love. You know, I've got something here somewhere that should have been in the notes. That's it that I had here. Aren't you glad that Jesus never treats us as we deserve? Aren't you glad that he doesn't treat us as we deserve to be thrown into hell and to perish? He treats us with forgiveness and grace earned for us by the Savior on the cross who died for our sins. In 1 John 4, verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. Because we couldn't, we couldn't care at one point in our life. Somehow his grace snuck through, through the kindness of someone that was one of his disciples. And I hope that you see yourselves not just as believers, not just as attenders, in a service from week to week, but as disciples. Because the disciples themselves were commanded to go out and make disciples of all humanity. And if you have accepted the offer of Jesus Christ and have become a follower of his, you are a disciple. God can enter a life that's filled with 
hate and selfishness. He can change it. In a sense, that, that's the meaning of conversion itself. No one is beyond God's healing power to love. God gives us the opportunity to be his entering wedge. When people are starved for love, they may first need to experience that their lives are empty. Then they can be pointed to the source of completion. If you feel empty, ask God to fill you. As Jesus said to the woman at the well, he came to ask her for a drink of water, and he told her that if she wished, he could supply her with water that would never run dry. And he was talking about himself. God asks no one to feel loving. He just says, be loving. Now, here it is. I knew I had it here somewhere. Number four, the fourth revelation here. Does anybody know who Kay Kuzma is? Some of you that watch 3ABN knows who she is. She's a counselor. She, uh, she's educated in trying to help people with emotional problems. And she has written a book called Creating Love, which I found was fascinating. That love only comes from love. Have you ever thought about that? Nobody invented love. He who is the creator of all things is love, and he brings it with himself because that's what he is. It doesn't say in 1 John that he is loving. It says that he is love itself. Now that's staggering, and we can't always understand what all that means. But love is giving, giving of oneself to another without the expectation of receiving anything in return. She's written down 15 characteristics of love that comes from 1 Corinthians 13. Um, you're familiar with it. Again, verse 4 is actually the heart of it, and continuing on to the following verses. It's very interesting. Now, you have to remember that the chapters and verses in the Bibles that we have are not inspired. They were invented to be able to help people to source certain statements or understandings about God. And so... Verse 14, I'm sorry, verse um, 1 of chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians continues the thought. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Pursue love. Pursue love. And the only, the only way to pursue love is to experience love as a gift of God. And we're going to talk about that in a few moments. Beginning in verse 4. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, and thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. So she goes through the list of 15 virtues that love is said to have. 
And I would like to take a look at what she has condensed. I think this is really interesting. She takes the 15 items and she condenses them to five because some of them are incorporated with others. The first one is to care. One day there was a, a merchant that was walking along the Jerusalem Jericho Road. Now, um, I've been to Israel twice, and some of the things that I saw from an Israeli guide was better than from an Adventist guide that we had. One of them was, was which we, they took us up from Jericho. We actually went up on fr Friday afternoon, and we had something in common with the Jewish guide because what happens after Friday afternoon? The Sabbath. Exactly. And so we had to get to the hotel before the, uh, the Sabbath started. But one of the places we stopped off was, I, can't, I don't know if I can describe this to you, but Jericho is the lowest place in Palestine. It's right near the Dead Sea, which is the lowest place on the face of the earth. And then it climbs way up on this, this winding, twisting road that goes around, around these mountains. And there's not much room on it. It doesn't look like it would be possible for two vehicles to pass. Somebody would have to let the other pass. And there are, there are places where the, the road gets wide, and then you look for who's coming and who's closest, and then you give way. So this man was accosted. He was a, a merchant. All of his possessions were taken. Um, his money was taken. And his life was almost forfeit because there were robbers there. Can you imagine someone who's a professed believer would see this sight and, would say, and come up and whisper to that man, you know, I'm so sorry that this happened to you. I'll pray for you and then go on. Because that's what happened, you know. The priest came and the Levite came and so forth. But then there came this person. In fact, Jesus asked those that were listening who were Jewish leaders, which one, was, which one did the work of God in showing mercy? And they refused to say the Samaritan because they hated Samaritans. But the one that showed him mercy. And he took him to the inn, and he cared for him. He poured into his wounds oil and wine. He paid for the night's lodging, and then when he came to the, uh, the innkeeper, he said, and th this is a beautiful thing. I think when I first came here, I preached a whole series of sermons about the church in the parables. And he said, whatever he requires, I will repay when I come again. Who does that sound like? It sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? Care. Words are good, but without caring actions, they are meaningless. Love has to have legs. It have to, has to have arms. It has to have a heart. The second one is R for respect, to honor and to esteem. I think Jesus was in Jericho. As a matter of fact, I think that's where this is. Somebody correct me. If I was in New Bern, uh, Brenda Moore would speak up, and she'd tell me exactly what it is if I'm not sure. Okay, Pastor, you know, this is it. Zacchaeus. Jesus went there, and Zacchaeus, you know, he was a, he was a little guy. He was probably five foot two or something. And he climbed up in a tree because he couldn't see over anybody. And Jesus stopped at the tree, looked up, and said, what? Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus? What, what is it they sing with the, the little song that the kids sang about that? You come down mm -hmm. from I'm going to your house today. He honored him by entering into house, his house even though he was a publican. You see, publicans worked for Rome. That's bad enough. But in order for them to get their payment, 
they collected what Rome wanted in tribute and they could add something to it. And that was theirs. And so they were despised. But Jesus showed Zacchaeus respect. Without asking, what did this Zacchaeus do? He promised to restore whatever he had taken unjustly fourfold. Jesus didn't ask him to do that. Who asked him to do that? The Holy Spirit asked him to do it. A, acceptance, having unconditional love for others. It's a basis for self-acceptance. It frees people to be themselves. The woman at the well, Jesus knew who she was. She was astonished that he knew. Why did she come in at midday to get water? Because the other women would come in the morning and in the evening, and she wouldn't have to encounter all these women whose husbands she'd been messing around with. But did Jesus condemn her? No, he unfolded the message of salvation to her and made it available to her. He accepted her. F is for forgiveness. The woman caught in adultery. Jesus wrote the sins of her accusers down. You see, the accusers had set up the sexual situation where she could then be caught. How else could they catch her in the act of adultery? Wait a minute. You can't do that by yourself. They set that up too. And so Jesus, Ellen White tells us about this. She, she wrote what he was writing were their sins. And one by one they left and there were none left. And he said, who is there that condemned thee? No one. She said, no one, Lord. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And then there's trust. God is the best example. He is completely trustworthy and completely dependable. Now, I've done something to my notes here, and I apologize. By the way, thank you all for asking. Many of you asked, how am I doing? I'm not going to have a repeat demonstration of what happened two <laughs> Sabbaths ago when I was choking, and Lola so kindly said, there's a bottle of water, and there, there it is right there, another one. Brenda brought up a napkin, and you brought up a lozenge. Somehow I was able to finish the sermon. I don't know how, but it worked. It worked. Here we go. That's what I was looking for. Viktor Frankl, a Viennese Jew, was interned by the Germans for more than three years. He was moved from one concentration camp to another, even spending several months at Auschwitz. Dr. Frankl said that he learned early that one way to survive was to shave every morning. Now think about that. No matter how sick you were, even if you had to use a piece of broken glass as a razor, which he did. For every morning, as the prisoners stood for review, the sickly ones who would not be able to work that day were sent to the gas chambers. If you were shaven and your face looked ruddier for it, your chances of escaping death that day were better. Their bodies wasted away on the daily fare of ten and a half ounces of bread and one and three quarter pints of thin gruel. They slept on bare board tiers seven feet wide, nine men in a tier. The nine men shared two blankets together. The nine men shared two blankets together. Three shrill whistles awoke them to work every day at 3 a.m. One morning as they marched out to lay railroad ties in the frozen ground miles from the camp, the accompanying guards kept shouting and driving them with the butts of their rifles 
Anyone with sore feet supported himself on his neighbor's arm. The man next to Franco, hiding his mouth behind his upturned collar, whispered, If our wives could see us now. I do hope they are better off in their camp and don't know what's happening to us. Wasn't any better for the ladies either. Frankel continues, that brought thoughts of my own wife to mind. And as we stumbled on for miles, slipping on icy spots, supporting each other time and again, dragging one another up the on and and onward, nothing was said. But we both knew. Each of us was thinking about his wife. Occasionally I looked at the sky where the stars were fading and the pink light of morning was beginning to spread behind a dark bank of clouds. But my mind clung to my wife's image, imagining it with an uncanny acuteness. I heard her answering me saw her smile, her frank and encouraging look. A thought transfixed me. For the first time in my life, I saw the truth as it is set into song by so many poets, proclaimed as the final wisdoms by so many thinkers. The truth that love is the ultimate and highest goal to which man can aspire. Then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and human thought and belief have to impart. The salvation of man is through love and in love. It was love that kept his friend and him alive in the middle of hate. Aren't you glad that Jesus never treats us as we deserve? Only as we need to be treated. 1 John 4, 19. We referenced this earlier. We love him because he first loved us. These tragic victims found love to sustain the horror that they lived in. We too need that vision of a God who loves us more dearly than any spouse could. Father in heaven, help us to live in love because there's only one way to receive it and there's only one way to show it because love only comes from one person in the whole universe, and that's you, Lord. You are love itself. And it isn't just a teaching or a belief or a practice, as if it was something religious. It's something far beyond. It's an intimacy that you offer to those that wish to follow you. And I pray, Lord, that we might exhibit love because we walk in love. That you might be honored and glorified, believed in, trusted. In Jesus' name, amen.